Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to this Wednesday's edition of Let's Talk with me, Julie Ali. Amazing guests as always, and I'm truly excited to have them on the show and to be in your company. We'll be talking to Farah Dina about the book she has written. It's called Soulful Sentiments. We'll also be talking to Amolana about the generation gap. How do we close the gap between parent and child, very especially today in the 21st century? I think uh, parenting is becoming more and more challenging. So we'll be looking into that issue. But first up, um, we're going to be talking art. And obviously, uh, it is truly inspirational having this young gentleman in studio with me. And you know what they say about art? Art is... When you look at a piece of art, you're looking at a piece of beauty, you're looking at a piece of memory, perhaps. You're looking at a piece of truly hard work coming straight from the heart. And that is what art, and obviously much more, that is what art is all about. Expression and how we as the general public view art. We all look at a piece of art and view it and interpret it differently. But what is it for the artist? What does he see? What does he do? What is the message to him when you commission a piece of art? And when, how uh, do you come about, um, you know, with a piece of art which is pleasing to everyone, the person who commissions it, and you as the artist yourself. My guest is called Blessed. He's in studio with me with some of his artwork and I must say that I've been blown away. He is only 22 years old but what an amazing talent. Let's talk to him about his work and what drives him and what inspires him. Good morning, welcome to the program. Good morning, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Lovely to have you here. And I must say that I truly admire people like you. Um, they often say that art, any art form for that matter, is a gift from the Almighty God. And undoubtedly, you've got an amazing name that suits your lifestyle. Blessed. You've been blessed with an amazing gift. And your gift, obviously, is art. So... We are often told that inspiration comes from many forms and many sources. Yes. What and where do you tap into this inspiration that you come up with amazing pieces of artwork? Well, I'm inspired by real-time real time events, like things that are happening in life. So it's the things that are surrounding me, the things that affect me, and the people around me as well. So that's drawn me to make the art that I make. How old were you when you realized and your parents realized that this child has got something special? He's been gifted with this uh, art form, you know, being able to draw pictures. And was there encouragement from them? Yes, there was. So I was around the age of six years when I used to play with clay and make sculptures, clay sculptures and stuff. And, and from that time is a time that I never stopped doing what I was doing. And my parents never stopped me, but they, they had to like put an ease on me because I was making a mess and stuff. <laughs> so, making a mess in the house. Yes. <laughs> so we go to a time whereby I, I started getting pencils from them. And then I started making use of those pencils. So that was one thing that encouraged me to never stop. So it, I kept on practicing and practicing as I grew. When you were at school, um, and that was back in Zimbabwe, yes. did the teachers there pick up that you have a special gift? And did they encourage it in any way, apart from your parents giving you all of the freedom yeah. to express yourself by way of artwork? Well, at school I wasn't that comfortable with showcasing what I was doing at home because I felt like it wasn't good enough to be out there. So at school, they never knew that I was passionate about art because I kept it inside of me and then I hid it. Till I, I got to a space whereby I felt like I should start getting feedback from people, which was right after school. That's when I started getting encouragement from different people who saw my artwork. What was your first art piece all about? What did it look like? And hopefully it was sold. Yes, it, is. <laughs> it was sold last year. Only last year? Only last year, yes. So you sold your first piece of art only a year ago? Yes. How come? I mean, you've been involved in art all your life. 
Yeah, so I remember the first piece of art that I made, it was in watercolor and I had got in the watercolor from a friend back home in Zimbabwe. So it was of the Zimbabwean stones that you find on money. So my granddad used to work there, so we had a lot of those logos. So it was something that meant a lot to me and it was going for a very, very expensive price because I didn't want to sell it at all. So somebody came and then they saw it and then they were blown by it the way I did it because I was so free to move my, my strokes anywhere I was moving it because I was still a kid and I wasn't scared of messing on the paper. So it was just a beautiful art trick and then the passengers came and then that's how that disappointed us here. Yeah. So that was an abstract piece of art? It, it was semi-realistic. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? What does semi-realistic mean? Oh, to me, it's like something that is close to be real art, realistic, but it's not. You can see that this is a painting. Okay. Yes. Moving on, you then came to South Africa yes. and you continued your passion and your passion is art. Yes. How difficult is it to break into the South African art scene. I mean, when you drive through the northern suburbs, you often see artists, not only paint artists, but you get, get the wire sculpturing and all sorts of different art forms yes. gracing the street corners and artists working truly hard to sell their art. Were you in a similar space? Well, for me, I was, I was blessed to have people that I knew from home with this side already. Because I remember when I moved this side, there was a friend, my father's friend, my father's old friend, his name is Varia, he's an artist as well. So he's the one who carried me through all the places that he was going through and showing me all the ways and how to do it. So he was a mentor to me in a way. But you haven't had any formal art training? No. You've been totally self-taught? Yeah, totally self-taught. So what we're looking at here today, the two pieces, is free expression on your part. Yes. Has anyone ever criticized your art, looked at it and said, this is wrong, that is wrong? Or in your mind, as in my mind, it doesn't matter what the art piece looks like, it's the interpretation and the story tells you. Yes. So I've been criticized a lot of times, eh? So, um... Every time I go to showcase my works, there's always an artist who comes along to view the stuff and they always tell me where I can improve myself. So to me, I wouldn't say that it was criticism. I would say that it was a lesson that I learned because everything that I got from them, I used it to better the next painting that I've made. So what sort of things have you been told up to now? What sort of advice have you been given by other artists in terms of improvement? Can you share that with us? Yes, um, so one most important thing was repetition. So if you do something, do it again and again and again and again till you can do it. So that's one thing that I've always taught to me that helped me through today. And um, as artists also, we mustn't tend to be sitting on the pallet and making work, work, work. We need to focus on the business side as well because that's where you can balance the sales coming in and making a living on it. Because at the end of the day, we don't get a fixed salary at the end of the month. What do you mean by repetition? Is the suggestion that if you're busy working on an art piece and you yeah. look at it and you work on it for two days, yeah. and then when you inspect it or look at it for possibly flaws, or it's not telling you the story you want it to tell you, yeah. that you need to redo that piece of art? Yes. That means a lot of wasted resources. Well, in this case, it wouldn't be wasted resources because every artwork that you're going to do, it is, you won't make it the same way that you did the other one. So they are going to be different in a way. So my first series, they were actually portraits. So for me, I was doing, I was repeating the, the first portrait that I've done, but they tended to be three different portraits, which was a plus on my side because I wasn't intending to do that, but they come out different because every time I'd go, they're trying to, to, to work on the parts that I did wrong on the first painting, it would be better that painting it looked better than the first one and different from the first one. But you don't destroy the first and the second ones, even though the third one is exactly as you expect it to be. No. What I do you do with don't. those first two Well, I keep paintings. them. I keep them in my portfolio. So as time goes, I always go back to them and look at them and look at the ones that I'll be making at that time and compare if there's been any difference or am I growing or not. Now, we know that artists have a very hard life. Unless you're truly recognized and you get commissioned by possibly corporates or very rich clients, yeah. 
it's a hard slog for you. You've really got to be knocking on doors and hope and pray that someone's going to commission you or perhaps buy what you have on you currently. Yes. Having a portfolio, doesn't that also weigh you down in terms of the investment you've made on the portfolio? Because that's a whole lot of paintings that haven't been sold. Yes, yes. So um, the portfolio, it comes in use when you apply for, um, for galleries and applying or, or showing people what you can do, what you are possibly able to do. So with me, I've never looked at that side because I, 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 I always have something new that I want to say. So I've been expecting people to accept what I'm making at that place and what I'm saying at that time. So I've never like looked at the portfolio, but I used it for my personal uses as in looking at it and seeing if there's any type of growth in my works. Let's go for our first ad break and we'll talk about growth and we're going to also ask you to interpret these two pieces of artworks here. Yeah. I'll tell you what I see in it and you can tell me the story as well. What drove you and inspired you to do, to, to paint these amazing pictures but more of all of that right after the ad break blessed is my guest an amazing artist only 22 years old trying to break it and make it in the art world and with the pieces that he's brought in some of them we're unable to show simply because we don't have the space available in this very tiny studio but he truly is a wonderful artist let's talk to him more right after the ad break Welcome back. Blessed is my guest. He is an artist and incidentally he happens to be the son of one of our colleagues here at ITV Networks. Her name is Irene. Wonderful lady. She takes great care of us and we love her to bits. So Irene, thank you indeed. You've been blessed with a wonderful son and you've named him appropriately. Blessed, you have a wonderful mother and I'm so glad that she's asked that we interview you because you're sharing your talents with us. Yes. Now, when people talk about artworks, as an artist, I think every time you sit down to paint a picture, it's like a child born to you. Yes. What would you say, and it's an unfair question, but what would you say is your fa most favorite artwork up to, to, up to today? And also, how many pieces of art have you produced up to today? Okay, so... Um, I've, I've produced, As a commercial artist, obviously, from yeah, the time you've come to South yeah, Africa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've produced a lot of artworks. Hey, I don't have number count, actually, apologies for that. But this is my favorite artwork. Like, everywhere I go, I go with this artwork. Simply because the story behind it, and, and, and I've tried selling it, but it still comes back to me because it feels like it belongs with me as well. So this piece here is the, is the main piece of, 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 of everywhere, of everything that I do, because it's self-explanatory itself. So, but we have said that different people would look at a piece of artwork and interpret it differently, yes. depending on their emotional frame of mind. But you do have a very really strong story behind this piece of artwork. Share it with us. Yes, okay, so this, this, this piece here is, 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 was inspired by gender-based violence, as in having women being abused by their male husbands, in a way. Because where I'm coming from, back home in Zimbabwe, we have a lot of cases of that. I grew up seeing a lot of things like that. So in this piece, I, I use the hand as a metaphor of a masculinity man who is abusing. Covering the woman's mouth. Yeah, so that she cannot be able to talk or to shout or to scream out loud, because he knows what he's doing is not okay. So I use the, the eyes and the um, drips of the tears to express the emotions or the feeling that, that is caused by the certain things that people are doing to females. And also I use coffee as a metaphor for women because most houses coffee stays in the kitchen. And most people tend to see women as people who, are, who belong in the kitchen. Wow. You did tell me earlier on that you used coffee for her face yes. and the coloring obviously you got spot on yeah. but I didn't realize the link between coffee and the kitchen and a woman's place being in the kitchen yes. so for a 22 year old man you wise beyond your years you seeing things and interpreting it so deeply yeah. and I kind of wonder what else you've been exposed to <laughs> hello Tay so um 
I, 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 I've, I've been doing a lot of work. So there are other works that talk about gender roles. There are other work that, uh, other works that talk about gender expression itself. As you can see, like things are changing now as we're growing. Like we see people, they tend to choose what they want to do and what they want to do, which is gender expression in a way. So I've been exposed to a lot of things and it has been a good thing for me as an artist because now I can put it on the paper and share with it with other people who are never exposed to those things. You've also told me that it's really a very difficult market to break in. Yes. And we know in terms of the economic situation in South Africa, artwork is seen as a luxury. Yes, yes. So it's going to get that much more difficult for you to sell your artwork. You don't have transport, you're not mobile, which means when you need to go and sell or showcase your artwork, you actually carry it physically with you. Yes. Have you lost lots of artwork by so doing in terms of damage, loss, um, etc. Yes, I've, I've damaged a lot of works myself, especially the ones that were framed in class, and which was a, a huge step back for me because it takes time for me to raise funds to, to, to invest in a frame for an artwork. So it has happened in a lot of cases. Eh? Let's talk about commissioning. Yes. So if somebody comes to you, uh, most of the time when you're not being commissioned to do a piece of art, you're just self-expressing and creating lots of artwork in the hope that you'll get a show at a gallery yes. or you'll go to some pop-up art exhibition and get your work seen and sold, hopefully. But when you commission, do you ask for some sort of a retainer up front? Because, I mean, you need to invest in all of the materials and yes. materials are expensive. Yes. So um, when it comes to commission, I, I make my clients pay uh, a deposit before I start working on the artwork so that I'll be able to buy the materials that are needed for me to do the artwork. And then after I'm done with the, with the, with the, with the artwork itself, that's when I go and meet up and then they finish up with the payment. Okay, let's talk about the different types of art. We know that there's charcoal, pencil, uh, watercolors, crayons, paints, etc. You've also told me that the face of this woman was done in coffee. Yes. But coffee and what? What is going to make this artwork live forever? Okay, so um, on this artwork, it's, it's um, mainly coffee, but I also used acrylic paints and charcoal on it for form and the other things like hair, because coffee I cannot make it that dark. So I, after I did this piece, I made it, um, I put it on the sun for, for quite a long time for it to dry properly, and then I, I varnished it with a, with a gloss varnish so that it stays glossy. So even in harsh weather, it still stays alive. And then I invest it in this frame so that it stays for longer than expected. Is that the norm for all artists to varnish their work, to give it longevity? Yeah. And where did you learn all of this stuff? Because you've told me you haven't been to formal art school. Yes. Um, vanishing artworks is a choice that one makes depending on how long they, they want the artwork to stay for. Of which there are other artworks that doesn't need to be vanished, medium-wise. They come with the varnish, like oil paintings, they do come with the varnish in it. So, Built-in varnish in the oils. Yeah, some of them, not mm -hmm. all of them. So, um, so what is the other question again? Is that standard practice? No, it's not. Okay. So I learned also about the vanish thing from asking around from people. So okay. as I said, when I came this side... Yes, I asked, say, how yeah. did you learn all of this stuff? Yes. Because you didn't go to art school. <laughs> yes, it was through asking other artists and visiting other artists. I remember there's a year that I, 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 I started being a friend of the August House, the big art studio in town. So I'd go there, knock in other artist studios, ask them questions and stuff. That's where I got to learn most of the things that I know today. Are they happy to share information with you? Some of them were, some of them were too busy. Yeah, okay, it was okay. Different. I've also noticed that both pieces that you have in studio are very dark colors. Yes. Now, I don't understand much of art at all, but I do know that when I invest, when I will invest in art, it will yeah. be in very vibrant colors. Why have you kind of stuck with the darker colors? You know, I'm thinking mood, I'm thinking lighting, <laughs> yes. I'm thinking emotional frame of mind, etc. Yes. So when I'm picking a palette, it, I, I never want to pick dark colors, no light colors. 
I just pick accordingly to the mood. As I say, like before I make an artwork, I do my research, I pick what concept I want to go with. And the feeling that I am feeling at that time is the one that drives me on picking colors. So the artwork that you see here, the colors that are there is because of the story that I am telling on the artworks. Do you kind of tap into the current political and global situation when you start working on a piece of art? And sometimes when you're sad or happy or angry, yeah. How does that piece of artwork then come out? Does it actually express your emotions? Well, in most cases and most artists that I've made, they actually tend to show my emotion at times. So I'm the only one who understands, like when I look at it back and then I'm flashing at the time that I was working on the artwork, like it just reminds me of the feeling that I had and it still provokes it at a time. And then when I'm talking with the person, I'm able to talk from my heart, not from the artwork itself. So you're actually telling your life story or the frame of mind that you were in when you were doing that piece of art. Yes. There's a brilliant story behind this piece of artwork. Please lift it up. Let's show it to the viewers. Show it up to the camera, to the camera over there. Just show it, lift it up a little more. Okay. What's the story behind this piece? And do you name your different art pieces? Yes, I do. So what is this art piece called? So this one, I, I, I named it Gold. 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 Yeah, so that's how it meant to me because I turned nothing into something. So wow. it's basically, so this artwork is actually made out of a palette. So as you can see, the coffee that is in is the same coffee I used here and the other paints on other on other paintings. All your I've leftover made. paints. Exactly. So I was supposed to throw them away and then I decided to put them on the paper and then it came out like this and then I decided to frame it. So it's basically turning something, nothing into something. So also it goes with me myself, like I'm coming from nothing and I want to be something. So that's what makes it one of my favorite artworks as well. Wow. Um, that being said then, uh, let's look at the issue around how your preferred mode of uh, materials. Yes. This is, you've used coffee, you've used uh, acrylic paints, you've used different um, materials to create this piece. Is that normal or do most artists go that route? And what is your favorite um, form of um, expressing your art? So my, what my, would you use? My, my favorite mediums are coffee, charcoal and paint. So with every artist they go at a, at a period of time where they experiment with different mediums, others they use oil paints, others they use different mediums that they can have at that time, and others they use the medium that they use today because they are the only things that they can get access to since buying them is um, another hassle. So me, myself, I chose to use coffee, charcoal and painting, so I remember at a time, the reason that made me use coffee is that we used to have coffee at home but not paintings because paintings were never on my mom's grocery list, so I had pencils. So I wanted to experiment more, and then I, sent, I ended up taking coffee from the kitchen, which made me symbolize a female, because I'd see my mom most of the times in the kitchen. Wow. Yes. Okay, um, so obviously uh, paints and charcoal and pencils and crayons, etc., pastels, etc., are very, very expensive. So if someone comes to you and commissions a painting, yeah. I also know as artists, you kind of are inspired by your mood, by your heart, by your feelings, etc. Yes. How, how does that interfere with you as an artist, your self-expression when you're being commissioned? So I come to you and I go onto the net and uh, you know take a picture of a Picasso painting, for example, yes. and tell you, please paint this for me. And we know that it's, it's a copy, but I want to put it on my wall. Yeah. How does that talk to you as an artist who's attuned to expressing yourself freely? Okay, so um, me as an individual artist, when I get a commission, I do talk with the client first as in how do they want their picture to be like, obviously the reference that they get from the internet. Do they want it to look exactly like that or they want the feeling of me in it? So they are the ones who tell me how they want it. So if they want a copy, exact copy, I'll work on that. So that means that there won't be me expressing myself, but it will be me learning another technique from the great artists wow. of the picture. Okay, we've almost come to the end of the time, but very quickly, yeah. what is that something special? So I give you a copy, I ask you to copy a Picasso for yeah. me, but I also say, put a little bit of yourself, your soul yes. in that picture. Yes. What are you going to do differently? Well, obviously Picasso never painted with coffee. <laughs> so you're going to find coffee in <laughs> okay, it. Yeah, okay, okay. So, and it's going to be a great um, exercise for me as well, 
for learning the masters how they did their things and also putting myself in it maybe it can lead me to a new concept that i've never done before wow okay yes. how do people get in touch with you oh so i'm on instagram and facebook as blessed art b l s d s art and also my um email address binyakaris at gmail.com Okay, yes. easier to go on the internet. May you be blessed throughout your life. You've got the right name. You're very talented. It was wonderful talking to you. Yeah. And may you grow from strength to strength. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Okay. Blessed is his name. And we hope and pray that the rest of his life ahead will be blessed in every possible way because he brings us amazing artwork. And check out his... Um, you know, check, check him out on um, social media and learn more about his artwork. And who knows, you could commission him for a piece of art in your home. And welcome back. Molana Mubarak is our guest and he's going to talk child rearing or rather the generation gap. And I think that's a question or an issue that we will never tire of talking about because we're in the 21st century, we're in the age of technology, the fourth industrial revolution, and our kids are way ahead of us in many, many aspects of life. So Molana is here to talk about that gap. How do we close it? What are the foundation steps that we need to put in place? And how can we raise children who understand us and whom we understand? Assalamu alaikum, welcome to the program. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Pleased to be here. Lovely to have you here. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Um, it's not being, it's, not easy being a parent in this day and age. Mm -hmm. I guess it never was easy yeah, because yeah. as parents, sometimes we take, you, I, I guess you have two sets of parents, yeah. those that take their role way too seriously yeah. and the children then perceive them as being very controlling yeah. and those who are very lackadaisy. And yeah. again, with yeah. both scenarios, uh, the poor children then are grappling with issues on their own, yeah. either to break yeah. away from a very controlling parent yeah. Yeah. or a parent not putting down firm enough and clear enough boundaries for the children. Yeah. Now, it's very refreshing to see someone as young as you, a man of the cloth, yeah. talking about the generation gap or child rearing issues. Yes. How come you've become so interested in this issue? Um, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, it is actually a cry in, uh, in all of, it's a universal cry of which, uh, it, despite your race, despite your location, your standards and everything, uh, as a parent or as a child, you will have to face something even before going out of the street. Uh, it's either you're going to be uh, sharing with your friends or you're going to be sharing with your teachers and, and so forth. But it will come to that point where you, you try to express what is my condition at home. Whether you are raised in a, in a manner which uh, you are happy, obviously it will reflect outside. And then if you are re raised uh, in a manner that it is not uh, conducive and healthy for you, it will also reflect uh, outside of the, the house. Uh, like that of the advice of uh, Hazrat Luqman salam, when he told uh, uh, his son Theron that you have to be, uh, you have to make sure that you respect your parents at home, and then um, when you go out to treat people, do not uh, raise your voice or act with pride in those things. So that uh, shows the balance that Luqman salam, he showed in in raising a son. Um, I mean, after all, we have to understand that being a parent is a privilege. And a home, it is a place where these, uh, the, the women and men are raised for the community. So if uh, the child is going to reflect uh, a father who's not uh, having a good uh, teaching uh, guidance, I mean, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran guides the parents in how they should raise the kids, that means it's fairly a right of the child to be raised in a manner that when he goes outside, he serves his community. It reflects the home of Islam or the home of uh, the teachings of the Prophet and the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is a, uh, a thing of uh, a location that people uh, people come across you, I mean, uh, 
the neighbors, uh, friends, they can distinguish uh, which one is okay uh, for my child to associate with. So they come to you that, uh, can my uh, my son be part of this? Can my son be part of this raising? My mother is uh, is not yet a Muslim, but he loves my religion. He loves Islam. He supports, uh, she, she supports it, and um, she, she gives a whole 100% of support to it. And therefore, I am the example of, the, uh, of Islam, what Islam teaches me. So when I walk outside of the door, I also show what my mother is bringing out of me and what is Islam bringing out of me. So it is very, very important uh, as we are children, we take what our parents are actually giving us so that when we present it, it's, it's, in, a, it's in a beautiful platter. You were, you, you were born and raised on the East Strand. Yes, yes. What sort of work are you involved in, in that part of Gauteng? Okay, um, uh, I personally, uh, on my, on my uh, personal space, I'm a coach for a football uh, team. And, <laughs> yes. And then I also facilitated the masjid, you know. So, Which masjid? Uh, Al Yassin. It's in? It, uh, Al Yassin yes, in Langeville. In? in Langeville Extension 8. Langeville, yes. and that's on the East Strand. Yeah, it's on the East Strand. Okay. Strand. Yes. So what we do there, it we obviously deal with kids throughout the day, and in, in the afternoon I have to see to the different kinds of characters of of children, you know, and that's the that's where this. Are all Muslim or non-Muslim children as well involved? No, uh, I think there's two Muslims in that team. Uh, the whole uh, the whole team. It's. Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, children uh, from the location who comes and play soccer. So um, there you deal with issues that will actually uh, provoke you to deal with certain things and to probably talk about certain things, whether it's in the masjid, whether it's uh, when you go visit to the, uh, the, the parents of those children. And you find that some of the parents, they come and they, um, they cry on you and that my child here at home is acting like this, my child here uh, is doing this one, two, and three. When you get, go at school, he has a different character. You know, this, um, this two-faced thing, when you walk out of the door, you are, you, you know, you're friendly, you can associate with everyone. And you know, it is very sad that the children that we supposedly have to raise, social media is actually raising them for us. So it is very difficult for us to, to you know, to keep the relevancy in them because we think that um, we think that social media it is um, a place where they'll be lost. But we can, you know, try to see their space. You know, they say um, when you want to understand a child, be the child. You, you don't, you can't make a child be an adult. You, it is easy for a parent to be a child because of she or he uh, has been there. So be the child for you to understand the child. Come to the level of the child and be a friend. You know, it's not always the father who or the mother who has to be a parent. It is not always um, the case of giving or taking the, ch the child to school where you have to be a parent. Sometimes you have to be a friend. Sometimes you have to sit down and laugh, play games and what so forth. And so uh, move out of your comfort zone. Because um, raising a child, it does, uh, sometimes it does not only take a parent, it takes the community. We only do it. We've once. lost that, have we not? We've the lost whole, that. The whole yes. spirit of a village raising a child. Uh, we've become way too westernized, and yeah, yeah, yeah. we've adopted these western principles where yeah. it's none of your business. Yeah, How dare yeah, you yeah. interfere in the raising of my child, etc. Yeah. And with it, we've lost a very, very va valuable asset yeah, as far yeah. as raising our children are concerned you know um the the other issue that i've uh, identified it is that most parents they have this thing that now i am the parent i have the entire right i mean the prophet muhammad sallam says jannah lies beneath the feet of the mother but that does not actually uh gives you the right it actually makes a route for the child to end his jannah it's not your jannah already so you have your part to play in ending your jannah so by the, raising uh, the child, an upright child, upright child, you know. So now that uh, being a parent, it is more of a um, uh, of a boasting thing that uh, my child, I'm not wrong in front of my child. I cannot make mistake. I mean, Ibrahim Ali Salam, 
told his father that you are making a mistake by worshipping the idols. You know, those are the things that the Quran keeps on showing us that you are all, being a parent does not mean you've reached a state of being an angel, but then you are still a human being or else you have to repent. You also have to come and end your jannat. As much as the child has to come to a point where he'll have to take care of you and end his jannat, you also have to play the part. We as Muslims take it for granted that because we are born Muslim, our children will be upright, they'll follow, you know, they follow the deen yeah, as yeah. was prescribed our beloved Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And sometimes because of that, we take things for granted. Yeah, we yeah. give our children way too much leeway yeah. and we know what the result is. We just need to go around to the malls or go out on a Saturday evening to yeah. favorite um, takeout spots to see uh -huh. what goes down. Yeah, yeah. Uh, designer clothes, expensive yeah, cars, yeah. loud music, etc., etc. Not even uh, talking about all the stupid fights yes, that break yes. out, which start on social media and land up at uh, you know on street corners. Yeah, yeah. We're going wrong. We're going off the track. Wow. How do we come back on track? How do we reign in our community? How yeah. do we ask for help? Yeah. How do we say, I need, I need the support of my community yeah. without being judged and being sniggered at? Um, you know, now being, uh, being at a stage or a span where we're moving very fast in life, uh, we have parents or we are parents that are rather uh, trying to hasten and, you know, chase standards and my house has to be this big and my life has to be this glamorous and so forth and so on. But then we forget the most valuable thing that I have to maintain at home. You go out at home uh, probably at four o'clock after Fajr, you leave the child sleeping there, you come back late at night, He's still still sleeping you're not known at home and then where else you'll call yourself a parent when are you making the child the person who was crying day and night enduring the 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 zulum of the the, the those uh, disbelievers the prophet muhammad sallam, he still found time in picking up a child and kissing him in, in, in that shock, a Sahaba asked that, do you, uh, is this a teaching of the Prophet of Allah? He said, yes, it is a teaching. This person said, I have 10 children, I've never kissed one of them. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, it is not my problem that you have lost the, the, the kindness for your children. So the thing now, it is that, um, it is the, 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 the understanding that a child is a blessing, and a blessing it is one thing that has to be looked after. I mean, like for instance, you get your, 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 your iman, your mm -hmm. iman is a gift from Allah, you don't look after it, you lose it. So now we are sitting and saying, I am losing my child, my phone is not ringing every day, my child is not uh, calling me. Because of now you sent him to school, you sent him to madrasa, you're not even calling him. You're and everything you shared with me is not it is universal. This is yeah, a universal yeah, message. Yeah. It's not discriminatory yeah, at it's, all. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's not only uh, biased towards or yeah, against yeah, yeah. a particular nationality. Yeah. We are all human beings, yeah. despite our color, creed, mm -hmm. um, or affiliations, political or otherwise. Mm -hmm. We all hanker after the same thing, yeah. and we all want the same thing for our children. But let's get to it right after the ad break. Molana sure. Mubarak is my guest. We're talking about the generation gap. We're talking about children in this day and age. And where are we going wrong as parents? Obviously, we've done something horribly wrong. Uh, that is why we're sitting with the type of problems we're sitting with in this day and age. More of that right after the ad break. Molana Mubarak is my guest. We're talking about the parent-child generation gap. Now, obviously, it doesn't have to be there. We don't need, or we, you know, the gap wouldn't exist if we as parents did things right from the time the child was little. What mm. happens when your children are grown up mm. and you have this huge gap, this huge generation gap? They're going off and doing their own thing. They disrespect you. Mm. Um, the house is not a peaceful home. They're screaming matches. If ever you try and guide your children by giving them good advice, mm. they accuse you of being controlling. Mm. They shun the parents and tell the parents to get out of their lives. 
Mm -hmm. Is it too late at this point in time? What sort of interventions can be put, put in place in this, in this type of a scenario? Um, I mean, uh, it will come. Uh, it's an everyday thing. I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also made it such that uh, Allah, he says, he will test you with the good that you have in your life. I mean, be it is your spouse, your children, and so forth and so on. So it is an everyday thing that you will be tested uh, in what you're giving. Sometimes you can be a parent, a parent who is uh, in the right path, who's doing things good. Yes, you have, you may have uh, your flaws there and there, but it does not actually entail that the whole thing it is gonna you know show out to be a good result at first but then the point is that um, sometimes we have to go and sit down and reflect on what is wrong that we are doing there are things that we probably say um, in spite and uh, probably you know lashing out you know you, you don't actually think that you might saying something and those kind of things and the kids tend to hold on on something that they're more helpful than the good things and you know um, uh, one time my younger brother uh, asked my mother that uh, if you break the cup no one hits you but if I break with a cup you hit me so what's the problem you see when that uh, that understanding comes forth that means there's a certain approach that needs and needs to be taken I mean you can involve the father more or you can both now take the I mean if the father is not at home you're the one who's taking the burden I mean from the young age up until he reaches uh, seven years and at the time where he's grasping everything he noticed that the father is not home obviously he's gonna be more uh, more lashing out on you because of now there is no Father figure at home. I mean, uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, through the the mouth of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, every child has the right to have a father. But having a father, it is not you providing, bringing money at home. You make time for the child so that he understand. You know, there are certain things that a father does to the mother that a child take notes of you know um, the arguments and those kind of things children they tend to find those things as a norm because of they happen at home you cannot wait and probably when they're asleep and you address the matter probably when the doors are locked and uh, uh, in the private you don't uh, you do not do that but you want to lash out in front of the kids you want to show them that i can be bossy at here at home i am the father i do this this and that so it becomes a norm to the child that if something wrong it is not to be fixed, but I can lash out also, you see. So that is why I'm saying sometimes it's good when we go back and sit and reflect. You know? It's fine yeah. to reflect, but what do you do in a situation where you have adult children yes, yes. who are very indisciplined or undisciplined and you have huge problems with them? And, yes. you know, there's issues around, there's this tug in war between guidance and control and disrespect and them doing their own things. I mean, we just need to look around our current uh, yes. scene today as far as our young children are concerned. And let's not generalize, yeah. not every house, some homes, households are very quiet and very happy and very respectful. But there are lots of issues in, uh, in the Muslim community and globally, yes. in all communities, yes, there's yes. issues around premarital sex, there's issues around, mm -hmm. um, you know, extramarital affairs, there's issues around drinking, gambling, drugging, yeah. all of that. And it's making a huge impact in our homes and on society at large. How do we address all of those? And I know you work mainly with little children. Mm -hmm. And I know that your, um, your thinking, correctly mm -hmm. so, is to set very firm foundations. Mm -hmm. But what do you do with young adults? Um, I mean, um, when you're going to be dealing with uh, adults, it's, uh, it's going to be a, a total different thing because of now, it is not one-on-one -on -one kind of a relationship or upbringing. Now it is you against the society or against whatever that is influential outside. When he walks out, he goes to school, he finds probably 600 schools that are influential to him. He has a phone who has 700 or 7,000 followers that are influential to him or soccer stars whatever the, the TV or whatever that they, they are exposed to my friends has this I don't have this and those kind of things you know so now it is all about um, this thing of uh, being competitive in who's who's there who's here who's doing what and how does he do it and those kind of things so now it is only the matter of you know seeking those um, uh, those extra hands 
you know, in helping them. Probably you can find a Mulana nearby or a consult uh, a social workers and those people who can, you know, help you. Same similar uh, case with me. I'm not only dealing with the with the kids, but I 17 year olds, 21, and those kind of. I have to sometimes be hard, but I feel that being hard, I can probably chase the boy away or he will never come back. But then now I try to reach out with 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 different angles. The way I use probably people with professions and who can deal with more with kids and so forth and so on. Yeah. Let's look at the issue around good parent versus bad parent. Um, children are very manipulative and they can yeah. play you up. So you have a father who's pretty soft and a mother who's very, you know, the, the disciplinarian. Yeah, yeah. And the child is going to play those parents up against each other and then obviously the intent is to get the best outcome for himself, the child. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how do we, and of course, then the child befriends that parent and gets, gets away with murder, literally yeah, yeah. and figuratively. What is the golden rule as far as that is concerned? I know earlier on you said if there's a conflict of interest, whether between husband and wife or yeah. if it involves a child, go into a quiet room, close the door when the children are sleeping, discuss the issue, yeah. but don't fight in front of the children because you're giving them all the wrong messages. Yeah, yeah. They're going to think it's all right to resolve conflict in that way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a saying in English, when, when the boat is sinking, don't try to save all the people. Firstly, try to find a solution to the problem uh, of the sinking boat. You clack know, the so, hole. Yeah, clack the hole, probably <laughs> the boat will float and you go to the shore. But then now the thing is that um, children, it, it can only go to up a certain stage where they, you know, choice are made for them and uh, they can be, you know, fed and so looked after. And, but uh, there comes a stage where a child has to take a responsibility too. I mean, having to play the part at home, doing the dishes and so forth, and, you know, helping with the cooking and those kind of things, those will obviously have that thing that I am part of something here at home. Therefore, I am. I don't have to set an example that is apart from these two people. When the mother is too hard for uh, to the child, it is for uh, for the greater good. When the father is too soft uh, to the child, he probably sees that it's also good for him. Uh, Trying to create a balance. A balance thing. But now, if it is not working, it is only fair for the parents to see that you know what you're doing to the child. You're spoiling him too much, or you know, now he's, he's becoming uh, vulgar with me or he's very relaxed, he's lazy at home, he's not doing it. Try to talk to him that he has to play a part at home. Even the father, if he would stand up, play the part, not being a father that I have to go work, pay bills, then sometimes I have to cook, sometimes I have to do the dishes, sometimes I have to do the laundry here and there. Then he will learn that being a father or being the man or being the woman, I am not only to be treated at all time or looked after at all time, I have to also look after. I mean, if Allah SWT says, take, care, uh, take good care of your parents, means that uh, your jannat now, it has to be earned. It, it will come to a stage where you have to end your jannat, where you have to take care of your, your parents. If your father is angry at you, Allah is angry at you. If your mother is angry at you, there is your jannat, the, door, the, door, the doors are closed. So it is also a responsibility that has to be instilled inculcated in a child that when you come to a certain age you have to play a part here at home you know yeah i think that's because of the day and age we're living in there's a lot of disconnect between parents and children yeah, uh, regardless yes. of how young or how old the the child is yes. how does one try and bridge that gap it's difficult communication is very difficult yes, to yes. have a hearty Honest conversation mm -hmm. with your child can be very uncomfortable, very uneasy, because they're going to tell you some very hard truths and <laughs> vice versa. Yeah, yeah. How do you start that conversation without it blowing up into huge conflict? Um, I, I think, you know, looking back uh, from the history, old ages and stuff, uh, there was a time where the parents, they would even, uh, they would tell you that, you know what, now you're at, at age, we've seen someone for you to get married, those kind of, you know, um, sensitive conversation, you know. So now we're at the age where the children say, mom, I've seen someone instead. You see how things have changed now. So 
I feel me, uh, this is from my personal experience that, uh, you know, I feel it's more good when the, the mother or the father, the parents would occasionally share their childhood. You know, uh, you know, laugh about it. Not all the time they have to be serious with the kids. You know, all the time they have to, you know, be parents. Hence, I mentioned that you have to be a friend. You know, mention your childhood, where you, where were you raised, and uh, how was your childhood? How did you grow? And those things, because of you hold those um, conversation with the child, it makes it easier that you will know the child when he's not okay. You'll know the child when he's okay or something is happening to him. The changes and those kind of things. And then it's easy for you to waltz in and you know and help because of now you are used on holding conversation with him. Now I've noticed that you've grown and probably you're doing these certain things. What's happening? What's going on? I mean, if he knows that my mother or my father talks to me, we hold sensitive conversation. I mean, um, a father shares how I met your mother and those kind of things. The child will come and say, Dad, this is happening, or Mom, this is happening. You know, so I think being, hence I mentioned also that coming to the level of the children is most important. Because now we sometimes want to use the old method of, you know, uh, being hard and you know being strict that now it is no longer applying with this one you be too hard to break the wood you be too soft the wood bends the, the, the different direction you see so i guess it's it's all about being close to the children in whatever way that you can afford to you know probably um call them or try to you know hence i mentioned board games and those kind of things play even soccer it will amaze them that my mom is playing soccer i've never seen her in this you know bake with them send them in the shop, make shopping with them, those kind of things. It Involve them in as many activities yes. as you can as a family. Yes, and yes. unfortunately, that's all we have time for. But it was wonderful talking no, to you, Shukran, exactly. very much for your time and your knowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and accept <laughs> all of your efforts. That was Maulana Mubarak talking to us about parent and child relationships in the 21st century and the challenges that we are facing and a few, you know, just a few tips that he's given us on how to be hopefully successful parents. Faradina Ismail is my guest. She's going to be talking about her book called Soulful Sentiments. How did that all start? Why she written this book? We're often told when people write books, it's because they've been through life, life journeys, the ups and downs, and somewhere inside of them, they believe that the story needs to be told. Maybe not as brutally as they've experienced it, but the story has to be told. Salaamu Alaikum, welcome to the program. Wa Alaikum Salaam, Jazakallah for having me. <laughs> My pleasure entirely. So is this a story that needed to be told? Um, I think it's parts of, of my story and other people's story that needed to be told, but it's um, sort of in the style of a message, of an inspirational message, because I'm all about inspiration and motivation. Who is Farah Dina Ismail? A strong, independent woman. <laughs> Mother Alhamdulillah. <of> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> yeah. Um, not South African? I'm not originally from South Africa, no. Um, I've been in South Africa for 13 years. Mm -hmm. I lived in Zimbabwe. I lived in quite a few countries in England. Um, I, I was the, the child of a, a Royal Air Force uh, parent, so we okay. traveled a lot. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and background in terms of studies or life studies? Life stu <laughs> I think it's more life studies than anything mm -hmm. else. Yeah, schooling in different countries. And yeah, we were always moving every six months uh, to another destination. <laughs> and I guess as hard as that might have been for you as a child, because it's having to start up new relationships, new friendships, new school can be very, very daunting. But yeah. that must have been a great life lesson for you. Yes, definitely. And I think that's, um, you know, a, an area where I've drawn from for my writing because, you know, I don't only, only write uh, messages. Um, I am writing a book as well. So it's all the life experiences I've gone through. Yeah. <laughs> Your book, Soulful, Soulful Sentiments, is really a little booklet. Yes. It started out... Um, by your musings or rather reflections yes. on the Juma khutbas. 
Just talk to us about that in more detail. Yes, what was yeah. it that kind of gripped you and why did you believe that these are very strong, relevant yeah. messages, that these type of messages mm -hmm. needs to be shared with the, with the world? Yeah. Um, like everybody, I was a recipient of uh, numerous Juma Mubarak messages. Um, and I found that they weren't really saying all the things that I wanted to say. So I started composing them. I've been doing it for, gosh, I think about five years now. And um, sharing one with friends and family on WhatsApp or on Facebook. And after a period, and it went on for a few years, um, where people would respond and say, oh, but you know, your message really helped me. It helped me to make a difficult decision. It's just what I needed to hear. And I thought, well, if there's so many people responding to me on them, why not put it into a book so I can touch a wider audience? And I touch on different areas like uh, kindness, consideration, faith, hope, all these topics um, that I think we need to hear about. And it's usually something that I'm going through or something that a friend's going through or just a general topic that I think, okay, that is my message this week. Something will happen and that sort of uh, is the platform where I start. So it's a booklet of really feel good, uplifting messages. Yes. Is it because you believe we're living in a very dark world? I think we have a lot of challenges um, in today's society and I think we all need a little bit of inspiration. We need to be able to pick up something and read it and say yes. I mean, I, I love quotes. I can trawl through uh, Pinterest and all these different sites looking for unusual quotes or something that just touches me and I like to share it. Talk to us about the book itself. How long did it take for you to compile it? And some of your favorite messages in, in the book. Yes. And has it changed you, changed your world yeah. view perhaps, and the type of feedback that you've been getting? Um, the book started, well, with the, with the messages, and I think I put it all into um, a Word document, and that's how I started. But it's been a journey. Uh, it's taken about a year and a half to get it to actually this. Uh, How to many a pages book. are there? <laughs> I think there's a hundred, hundred and two, okay. yeah. So, there, so it's taken about a year and a half. Um, I have loaded it onto Amazon. That was my first port of call as a Kindle, Kindle download and as a print. So a few of my overseas friends have actually ordered a print copy, which is wow. quite exciting um, and given me a review and, you know, things like that. Um, the cover, I'm an avid photographer as well. So the cover is uh, my sunrise pic from wow. where I stay, just outside my back door. So, wow. <laughs> um, so I, lo I love the colors of the sunset. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very uh, inspirational person, but I'm very inspired as well. Um, so I, I love looking at nature and I think, you know, uh, we are so blessed, you know, Allah has blessed us with so many beautiful uh, landscapes to look at, to enjoy, to capture. Um, and I feel the same way about words as well. Mashallah. <laughs> what does Farah do in her real life? Um, <laughs> <laughs> because here we, you know, we we sitting talking yes. with an author, possibly even a, po a poetess, yes. I should imagine. <laughs> Thank you. And um, photography is also close yes. to your heart. Yeah. And I'm certain you're going to perhaps say to me that you dabble in art as well. I do a little bit of everything. And I think um, I, I even I think at uh, some point I delved into even chutney making. So I'm, <laughs> my skills are wide and mm -hmm. varied. Um, I would like to do my writing full time. That's my ultimate, um, you know, goal. Um, yes, but until then, uh, I in work. In real life? <laughs> I mean, are you working? Yes, I do work. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm a PA at the moment. All right, so. wonderful. <laughs> so um, you've now reached out through the writing, through the book, mm. to scores of people. You've also mentioned that there's another book in the pipeline. Yes. What's that all about? Very different to this? Or? It is. It's not a book of messages. It is actual an actual story. So just detailing some of my life experiences, uh, places I've been to, what I've been through in my life. Uh, yeah, so it's, I think it's very therapeutic to write as well. You know, I mm -hmm. think you, you go through a lot just writing things down and remembering things. And if you're blessed with a good memory, I think that's a, it is great to be able to do it. I was it. talking with someone recently who's been through a very hard mm. um, life. I mean, there's just yeah. been so much upheaval in her domestic life. And I suggested mm. to her that perhaps you should 
because she's very angry at all the things that yeah. went wrong in her life. And I suggested, apart from going into therapy, perhaps you should journalize or just yes. write things <laughs> down, put things down on paper, and perhaps because we are told mm. these things, and then burn it and maybe you'll be rid of all of that poison in your system. The yes. thing that's gnawing away at yeah. you that you yeah. just can't seem to let you go, let go. Your thoughts and suggestions like that? I think it's a very good thing. Um, this, like, it is, like I say, it is therapeutic, but I think there's something, um, uh, it releases so much of your emotions just seeing it in black and white. And I think when you see it in black and white, it doesn't have the same hold over you. Um, we, I think it's a bit difficult to describe that, but it does. It doesn't feel as bad. I think you know when you see it in black and white, and you think, "Hey, you know, I actually went through that. I got through it. I'm still alive. I'm still here." Alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. You know, we just. Uh, I think you just have to do it. Absolutely. Um, back to the book, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, soulful sentiments. So you've had to listen religiously to the khutbas and uh, try and pick up other very inspirational messages to put yes. together in the book. Mm -hmm. Have you actually gone back to the sources to say, hey, this is what I'm doing. You know, I heard your X amount of khutbas and I'm compiling it into a book. And are you okay with it? I'm I, thinking in terms of copyright. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I haven't. Um, you know, a lot of my inspiration comes just from people I meet. Um, friends, family, um, people I interact with, uh, who will tell me a story. I'm a good listener, so I listen to all these stories. And I think that is the basis where um, I, I do my messages, I write my messages. And sometimes they take long. I mean, sometimes on a Thursday or Wednesday, I start them. Thursday, it can take me up to three or four hours just to write two messages, purely because you know, the inspiration has to flow. Um, and I think obviously I always look at a message and I obviously bring uh, um, sort of religion into it because I think, you know, everything is based on it. You know, we, we look at hope and faith, you know, we turn to, to Allah. So, you know, it's all sort of religious based. Although in this book, I've sort of taken the religious part out of it because I think it will appeal to a wider audience as well. We all need help somewhere along the line. <laughs> so all of these inspirational writings and you've, I presume, I mean, I was kind of thinking that uh, you took the khutbah or uh, the, the Friday talk and yes. you've kind of uh, put it down verbatim, but that's not what it's all about. Okay. You <laughs> kind of picked up one or two points of deep inspiration from yeah. that and you've built on it. Yes your frame of mind, yeah. your reference, mm. and kind of thinking about your own inner circle, how, how yeah. it would appeal to them. So you've yeah. kind of almost rewritten a new story or a new yeah. inspiration built on what you've heard. So a word or two you pick up here and there, you then build on it and uh, come up with a beautiful inspirational piece of writing. Yes, yes, that's correct. Um, and I think there's so much inspiration out there. There's so much to be talked about. Um, some of the Jimma messages I get are, are really amazing. You know, and I'll always comment and tell the person who sent it to me how wonderful it is. Because I think anything that can touch you and make you think and make you realize certain things, you know, I think it, it's such a good thing. Let's go for our first ad break. We'll be back in a minute or two. Farah Dina Ismail is my guest. We're talking about her book. It's called Soulful Sentiments. And I think it's a must-have book, especially in the day and age we're living in. You've heard all of the previous interviews, and it's all about doom and gloom, is it not? And it's about time we open up our eyes and started counting our blessings and being gratitude for all the good in our lives, rather than focusing on the darker aspects of our lives. And I think this book will do the trick. Welcome back to the final segment with Farah Dina Ismail. We're talking about her book, and of course it's called Soulful Sentiments. And we've been talking off air. I've told her that I've been threatening forever in a day to write a book, but I think you have to have it in you, not the book, the inspiration and the writing prowess to actually go out and do this, and it's a huge task. I mean, writers um, think long and hard about their writing 
And we, people like myself, sit here and think, oh, that must have just happened so magically overnight. <laughs> but it takes weeks, yeah. months, even years yeah. of putting a book together because it's the spaces that you go through, all the emotions yeah. that you go through. And sometimes you write a chapter and you're not in the right frame of mind to complete yeah. that chapter. It may be too painful. It may be bringing back very hurtful memories um, or you're writing a fun, loving, light chapter. But things are happening in your life. Your life has been turned upside down and there's no ways you're going to write that chapter. Mm. So how then do you draw on the thing called inspiration? <laughs> I think you have to be, well, you first you have to have a lot to inspire you with. And um, then it's just a matter of putting pen to paper. Yes, it does take a long time. You have to be in the right frame of mind because some of the chapters you touch on, as you say, are emotional. Um, they can be very heart wrenching. So you really have to be in the right frame of mind. But I, I think it's it's such an exciting experience. I wish I'd have done this earlier. I've always been an avid uh, writer, reader, um, literally from my school day sort of years. And uh, I wish I'd had started earlier. I wish I hadn't left it so late because now I just want to do so much and well, write so much. <laughs> in this day and age of social media, mm -hmm. we've been told by the broadsheets, etc., that less and less people are buying newspapers. I mean, it's going yes, to be a thing of the yeah, past sometime soon. Yeah. Do you think that books are still going to have a space and a place in our lives? Uh, yeah. We are in the instant age and we want yes. quick news, we want to digest things instantly and move Move on. Yes, definitely. I, I think, I mean, I don't even buy a newspaper anymore. So, and I used to be an avid newspaper reader. I used to be one of those moms used to read uh, make, or make my kids read in the car every day just to improve the English and the grammar. Um, but yes, I think I, I'm the generation that still likes books. I love the feel of a book, a Kindle, although I have one, um, it uh, doesn't have the same effect as turning a page. Smell and the pages. The smell. <laughs> yes, yes. And I, and I would hope that the younger generation, I mean, when I go to bookshops, I see the younger generation choosing books and that. So I hope that bookstores still stay. I think it's such an important part um, of our whole being that we get to read a book and pick up a book and choose a book. And our lives don't become whitewashed and clinical yes, definitely. via Colour. Kindles and <laughs> the social media platforms. Yes, yeah. There's a place for technology and we need to move with the times. So we hope and pray, inshallah, that books I mean, will play a huge part in our lives. Yes. Let me bring you back to inspiration. Yeah. I kind of wonder where and how you draw. You've yeah. told me landscapes, people that come in yeah. and out of your life, the place where you stay, the places you visited, your yeah. childhood memories, etc. But there's got to be that certain something that edges you on. I think it's just like a combination of all that. And I think, you know, I think every day we have a choice. Um, and I think we have a choice whether to get up happy or get up sad. And every day I choose happiness. I, I think, you know, we have such limited time. We don't know when our time is up. So my whole motto is make the moment, make the most of every single moment, live life to the fullest. Um, my kids get annoyed with me. They think I'm too positive. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I was about positive. to say, how <laughs> do you, too much. <laughs> how do you give that sort of message to someone who's going through a very torrid time yes, in their lives, yeah. in their marriage, with their children, with their boss, yes. whatever it is, with their finances, yeah. easier said than done. And Definitely. I sometimes will myself, and I say to myself, be in gratitude, count yes, your blessings. Yeah. It's not always that easy. It isn't. Yeah. That being said, I need to get a copy of this book mm. because I need to read all of these <laughs> wonderful inspirational mm. messages. When are you launching or have you launched already? Um, I'm hoping to launch on the 11th of March, inshallah. Um, we're having a launch at the Europa in Kalani. Um, six for six thirty, and we've got a few speakers as well. Oh, um, wow. We have a, a budding author that's about to launch his book as well, and I've got a few inspirational speakers because, of course, I'm all about the inspiration. Wow, wow! Um, so, inshallah, it should be a good evening. Yeah. You talk about a budding author. Are you doing some form of mentoring? Um, no, not really. I, I uh, is a friend of a friend who's also had quite a touching story and. 
um, when this friend mentioned uh, him to me, I said, yes, by all means, you know, uh, everybody needs a platform and it's a, it's a good platform for him to tell his story and Absolutely. talk about his book. Yeah. Please refer him to us. We'd love to talk yes, to him. Yes, that's all right. So you're yeah. launching in March. Do people have to RSVP or just pitch up? Just pitch up. Mm -hmm. uh, come have a meal at Europa, listen to all the, the speakers, um, yeah, and buy a book. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, in terms of budding authors, as you've mentioned, and people like myself who yeah. says that there's a book, you know, uh, or a story dying to be told, yes. but just don't know when, how to start. Yes. Could we kind of come to you and you help us along the way? Definitely, of or course. Or are there other platforms that we could go to? I'm sure there are other platforms. Um, when I was trying to uh, get my book published, I contacted quite a number of publishers. But because you're a new author, there's a lot of uh, obstacles when you're a new author. They want you to contribute to the publishing process. Ooh. And if you're not in that sort of, you're not able to at that stage, it's In difficult. that league. <laughs> yes, in that league. Um, but uh, I, I was offered six publishing contracts. Um, I got a very good re uh, written report on my book. Wow. Uh, but I chose a self-publishing route. And Alhamdulillah, it's been, you know, quite an enlightening experience. Wow. And I've enjoyed it. Yeah. Alhamdulillah for that. Um, you're going to share one or two of your very yes. inspirational uh, messages there for us yes. and why are those messages talking to you and hopefully yeah. to the rest of us? Yes, definitely. Okay. Um, kindness is the quality of being generous and considerate and doesn't have to include big gestures. It's in a simple touch, a friendly conversation and a radiant smile. Being kind should be as natural as breathing. We never know what the next person is going through at that particular time that we encounter them. And the kindness you display could change the whole world as well as your own. None of us are too mighty that we cannot offer or receive kindness. Alhamdulillah, yeah. that's the, obviously we're talking about the personality yes. of our beloved Nabi Karim yes, sallallahu alayhi yes. wa sallam. We've got two minutes to wrap up. What else do you want to share with our viewers this morning? Is there another message you want to share? I would love to share it at the message. Let me find a shorter one. Okay. Um, always be cheerful. Don't think of today's trials. Think of the successes that may await you tomorrow or the next year. Know that with perseverance, determination and faith, anything is possible. Don't ever give up. No matter how long it takes, you just have to be patient. When it all comes to fruition, it'll be well worth the wait. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> That's where we leave it. Thank you indeed Just for being with us so on the much. show. Loved having you here. That was Farah Dina Ismail talking about her book. It is called Soulful Sentiments. She is launching in March uh, in Kilani, at Europa in Kilani. Please attend, make an evening of it with your loved ones. Buy a book and support all our budding authors in our community. We need books to live on and be a huge part of our lives going forward. Thank you for being with me on the show today. I've loved being here. And as always, take care on the roads. And it is Khudafiz from me, Julie Ali.